Hello, and welcome to a special edition of Up Close on METV. I'm Charles Clapsaddle, Station Manager for Manatee Educational Television, and it's our privilege to have with us today three-term U.S. Congressman Vern Buchanan, who represents over 750,000 residents in his congressional district. Congressman Buchanan, welcome back to METV. It's always a pleasure to have you here and get updates and insight into what you're doing in Washington. Well, Charles, I just appreciate the opportunity to visit with not only you, but uh, a lot of your viewers, and I really appreciate what you've done here in terms of METV, educating yeah. Mantee County on a lot of key issues. Well, thank you, Congressman. I really appreciate that. But when I introduced you, I said uh, District 13, and District 13 is going to become something that you're not representing pretty soon, isn't it? Yeah, well, I'm going to what they call the Sweet 16. <laughs> <laughs> From, uh, That's good. The 13th, from the 13th, uh, it's going to get relabeled. We're picking up two more congressional seats in Florida because mm -hmm. Florida's grown. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go from, in terms of the House of Representatives, 25 to 27 members. And our district is one of the districts that has grown about uh, 80,000 additional residents. So we've gone in the last decade from 700,000 or 680 up to seven, 780. So we're going to be primarily, I'm very excited about, it will be... 99.9% .9 of Mantee County, all of Sarasota County, and then some of the outlying areas that I enjoyed working with, uh, they're going to be a part of another district, but it'll be the new, conf new district, uh, District 16. Well, you know, di whether it's District 16 or 13, you're still going to give that, uh, your, it's your everything to be representing your congressional uh, district. Congressman, every time that you've been here, every time you've been here, there's been kind of one major issue over the last couple of years that has been your focus, and that's jobs and the economy. Um, give us your update on, on the status of how things you think are, uh, you see them now, and what efforts are being made to improve those. Well, you're right. The number one issue by far is jobs and good paying jobs get people back to work. Uh, the last three or four years have been very tough on working families. So that's my focus every day. Uh, mm -hmm. They create, uh, small, I should say, small business creates 70% of the jobs in this district and most districts across the country. So we've introduced our jobs bill where we're trying to do everything we can to bring a better environment together mm -hmm. to help these small businesses grow in terms of trying to reduce regulation, uh, a fair or flatter tax. Mm -hmm. In fact, yesterday we passed out of the House a 20% tax reduction for small business. We're hoping the Senate deals with that. Also, we're looking at trying to cut frivolous lawsuits. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you can't get to good paying jobs without having strong, strong small business community. Mm -hmm. And I think things are getting better, mm -hmm. not fast enough. Uh, so we really need to continue to focus on helping our small businesses uh, hire more people in, in, in terms of good paying jobs. Well, recently we had the opportunity to do a program with the, the port. And you've always been a big supporter order of Port Manatee and the and kind of the job multiplier that that is and and how do you see the port being a big factor in in, in Manatee and and Sarasota County? Well, one of the the committee I'm on Ways and Means. Uh, I'm on the subcommittee for trade. Mm -hmm. We have 14 ports in Florida, uh, and they there's about 68 billion dollars of economic activity. I'm interested in all the ports, but the one I'm very interested in is Port Manatee. I think there's about 24,000 jobs that are uh, directly and indirectly at the port. We think we can double it, and uh, so we're working very closely. I'm on the uh, chairman of the caucus for the Panama caucus, mm -hmm. is to work with because they're looking to double their capacity or through, throughput there. We're going to work closely with them because the Port Manatee is right. the closest port to Panama Canal, we mm -hmm. think it's a real good opportunity to uh, create additional jobs in terms of the port here. Plus, I might add, I've heard, and I think it's true, 
that they pay on average uh, for in terms of jobs there about 20 30 percent more per job uh, than other jobs that are available in the in the county so it's really critical that we do everything we can to help port manatee we need the d economic diversity and we want to talk a little bit about your efforts and, and and the things that you've done on behalf of free trade but before we get there uh, one of the key things uh, that affects not only your constituents, but most Americans is high gas prices. You, know, you, you can't drive down the street without seeing gas prices going up and up. Uh, what efforts are being made? And what do you want to do about an energy policy? And, and, and on behalf of you know constituents in, here in Manatee and Sarasota, but throughout the state as well. Well, there's a lot of people, I feel bad, they're going to the, uh, fill up their truck or their car, and maybe at one point they're costing them $38, now it's $60, or a big truck it might be, mm -hmm. I've heard $80, $90. We need to do everything we can to make a difference there. We're trying to get this pipeline built, a Keystone Pipeline. Mm -hmm. uh, the administration has, has been giving us a tough time on it, but the bottom line is we think that's a great opportunity, not only to create jobs, but as I learned in my class, in econ class, it's supply and demand. You can't have the administration, a lot of people in Washington, trying to mm -hmm. decrease the, the uh, supply because all that does is put more uh, pressure on terms of prices. Mm. And so we're going to continue to do everything we can to make sure that we get more capacity here in the U.S. That being said, we need to also have all the above strategy. We need to be looking at uh, wind, solar, uh, nuclear, but mm -hmm. make no bones about it. It's about gas and oil in terms of uh, the next 10 or 20 years. I, I don't see there's not a magic bullet. I mean, I'm the first guy that would love to strap a solar panel on top of the car and pass up the gas station, but we also need to create a better environment mm -hmm. to make sure we've got the, the drilling and more oil. Uh, I'm not for drilling off our beaches. I've been right. pretty clear about that, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of other opportunities. In fact, they're talking about natural gas. We might have over right. 100 years supply. We need to get off foreign oil. We need to find a way to have more capacity. That'll drive down prices, and so we need to have that, that, that kind of leadership in Washington. Well, one of the key things uh, that, that you've talked about in the past is, you know, getting off of the dependence of foreign oil, which is to opening other resources within the United States, you know, to exploration. So, you know, do you think the Keystone uh, pipeline is, is, is that a step in the right direction? Yeah, no question about it. I mean, they're talking about hundreds of thousands of jobs that would be created right now. Uh, but we're trying to get the per permitting done. I was in Alaska, for example, and we've got a big pipeline up there. Mm -hmm. I met with a lot of the people in Alaska. We're at 30% capacity. The reason we're at 30% is because we can't get uh, leases up in north northern part of Alaska, mm. uh, EPA and other things. We've got to find a way to, we have uh, more oil and a lot more gas. We've got to free that up in terms of, again, driving down prices at the pump. And mm. as long as they keep the restrictions and the regulations, and they don't allow us to drill, then it really, uh, it'll, it'll continue to drive up prices. And they continue reliance on foreign oil. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things that you, when you first ran for office, which was one of the cornerstones of, of, of your campaigns, is to reduce government spending across the board. And that was a key element of everything that you've talked about in all of your campaigns. Now, how, first of all, how is that going? How is government spending being reduced, or is it being reduced, and is there enough being done? Well, Charles, I said the number one issue, uh, immediate, I should say the immediate issue is good paying jobs. The little longer term issue, and that could be three, five, or seven years, we've got to get our financial house in order. We are running trillion and a half dollar deficits. This year, the president put together that budget, the last three years. So when you think in terms of a stimulus of $800 billion, we've really had a stimulus of $5 trillion. Mm -hmm. When I came there, we were $8.6 trillion, uh, $8 trillion. It's almost doubled today in a matter of five years. And at some point, mm -hmm. uh, the country, uh, I don't know if it's two, five, or eight years, is in, won't be able to pay its bills. You're moving towards $20 trillion in debt. The normal cost of money is 4 or 5%. You'd have a trillion dollars in interest before you pay out one benefit to seniors uh, in terms of Medicare and Social Security, mm -hmm. veterans benefits. So it puts the whole country at risk. You know, if, if we don't change the way we do business, we're going to be the next Greece. That's why my first week when I ran for Congress, 
my biggest issue. I wanted a constitutional balanced budget amendment that you don't spend more than you take in. That's what we've got in the state of Florida, counties and cities, right. 49 out of 50 governors. Mm -hmm. uh, because if we don't, we put our whole country at risk. And uh, so I'm fighting every day for not only uh, for the counties here, but for the country to get our financial house back in order. Now, Congressman, you know, during your now you're in your third term as a uh, as a representative for this dis district, and you've been on the Ways and Means Committee, which is probably one of the more powerful committees in Congress. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on and and why Ways and Means is a, is an important committee for you? Well. I ended up being the only member in Florida on Ways and Means, Democrat or Republican. 60% mm -hmm. uh, of the legislation goes through that committee. Uh, you know, if you look at, it's the tax writing committee, because we're looking to mm -hmm. find a way to uh, deal with taxes that are flatter, fair, and simpler. We have 73,000 pages in our tax code. Hasn't been dealt with since 1986, and there's a lot of loopholes that need to be closed. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other thing is, is that, you know, it's also, I'm on the subcommittee for health and ways and means. Mm -hmm. It oversees all of Medicare. Mm -hmm. It's a great program, mm -hmm. but we, I want to make sure it's viable, not just for seniors today, but seniors down the road for our children and grandchildren. Mm -hmm. uh, it also it interacts or it oversees Social Security. So all the things that are critical to uh, you know, people in these districts, Medicare, Social Security, funding right. for veterans has to go through our committee because anything in terms of got a price tag or is going to mm -hmm. need revenues, all those things are very, very critical, critical to Manatee County exactly. and Sarasota County, and I want to do everything I can uh, to fight to make sure we protect seniors and our veterans because they've earned those benefits. Exactly. But yet, when you look at what's happening financially in Washington, we only take in enough tax dollars to pay the bills through July 27th. I think that's the average I've heard. Mm -hmm. We're out having to borrow the rest of the money the rest of the year, and that's why also I come back to we've got to get uh, a constitutional balanced budget amendment, get our financial house in order to protect seniors and veterans. Well, the House uh, Ways and Means Committee is consists of how many members uh, you know, from, from both parties? I think there's 22 Republicans and 14 or 15 Democrats that are and, on the committee. And you know, Florida and specifically you know, Manatee and Sarasota County are, are really in good hands be, with you being the only Florida representative on, on that committee. Well, I'm going to fight for seniors and veterans. Uh, they've uh, veterans. We wouldn't have our freedom if it wasn't for them. And of course, seniors have paid into Medicare paid into Social Security all their life, and I'm very concerned that if we don't change the way we do business in Washington, uh, it'll really affect Medicare. I think Social Security, we just had the Social Security Administrator down here. He said it's going to be viable, uh, you know, for the next 30, 35 years. But Medicare is the one that we've got to find a way to make sure uh, it, it works long term. I mean, yeah. everybody in Washington, Democrat and Republican, knows there are a lot of games being played around Medicare. But everybody knows if we do nothing, it's not an option because it goes broke in seven or eight years. And that's a very good point. But you did mention something that I'd like to, to take a few minutes to discuss, is that you actually brought the Social Security Administration Chief Administrator to, to Manatee County. But that's not the only. You've had the Secretary of Transportation, Roy LaHood, here. Uh, you've brought a lot of people down, which uh, you know is a good indication of the of, of, of the importance of your conversations with these uh, people in the administration how did the uh, how was that visit with the Social Security administrator well I think he was fairly impressed we've got a fairly new office mm -hmm. right out on 75 and Manatee Avenue out there we had a chance to give a tour of that looking at a lot of the new things that they're doing but uh, he's very impressive. He runs all of Social Security. Social Security is a big issue. I'd say 30, 35 percent of my district mm -hmm. uh, are on Social Security. I want to make sure that they're delivering a high quality service. Uh, that where there are some issues, we want to make sure that we got a good rapport with their office exactly. so that we can take care of our own constituents. Mm -hmm. But I want them to come down, listen to, listen to people here, get their thoughts and their ideas about how we can provide better service as it relates to Social Security. Well, I'm always you know, uh, uh, impressed with the quality and the caliber of the people that you invite to come down to Sarasota because, you know, they can go nationwide. Yeah. I mean, they can go to any big city anywhere in the country, make a speech. But uh, uh, over the years, you've had the opportunity to bring quite a few people down that, that are in positions of authority, positions of power, to come down and have a one-on-one -on -one with people in this community. And I think that's a, well, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity. I remember when you brought Mr. LaHood down yeah. and when you spoke over at the 
airport. The place was filled to capacity with people interested in transportation, port matters, airport matters, and it was very, very responsive to their questions. Well, uh, thanks, Charles. But I, I think at the end of the day, you know, it's, I'm humbled as a blue collar kid to be a congressman. But I'm a rep. I take it. I'm a representative. Exactly. I'm representing 750,000 people. I want to make sure our people are represented in Washington. Because what I heard before I ran, and being in business myself 30 some years, is that nobody's listening to Washington. So I want to take Washington, bring down uh, the top leaders as it relates to you know things that they care about, mm -hmm. and hear directly from our constituents, our people here locally, uh, to talk with the people that are running Social Security mm -hmm. or running Transportation Committee, because roads and bridges are important here. It means jobs, but it also means less congestion, exactly. less burning of fuel and stuff like that. So we try to bring as many of the people that uh, make the decisions in Washington to critical programs and make it available to, to hear from our constituents. So again, I represent them, and the best way to represent them is, because they can't all go to Washington, is to bring Washington here and hear directly from our constituents. And I hope you can continue to do that, because you get a great response every time that you invite people to come down. But I want to take a moment now, Congressman, if I may, to talk about something that you just mentioned, is that as we know, the, the Supreme Court has recently heard arguments about the new health care law being unconstitutional. And now you voted to repeal it. Now, it's still in the Supreme Court, or certain aspects of it are still in the Supreme Court, and they haven't def uh, uh, ruled yet. But from your perspective, what, what are your options? What do you see as alternatives to the health care uh, uh, bill that's on the books right now? Well, one of the big problems is, is that the health care bill that's uh, been passed doesn't do anything to lower the cost for mm -hmm. a family of four. What it does do is give 30 to 50 million people free or highly sub subsidized health care. This is a program that's going to cost you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. At a point in time, we're having a tough time paying the bills. Uh, so we've got to find ways to lower the cost. I was at a town hall meeting the other day and a woman raised her hand, a small business person, five employees, which is, makes up a lot of the small businesses. They have 20 employees or less. She says, I'm paying $2,000 a month for my health care. This bill does nothing to really address that. But what it does do, it'll end up costing a lot more money that we really don't have at this time. But we've got to continue to work on a bipartisan effort uh, for the best interest of the American Americans to figure out a way to drive our costs down. We need to cut our health care costs in half. We're twice as much as any mm -hmm. other place in the world, even many places that have socialized medicine. Mm -hmm. we, what we're paying right now, we could cover everybody. Uh, but we're just, we, we've got to bring everybody together, work on a bipartisan basis, and get a bill that makes sense. This bill does not work. If you had a crystal ball and uh, you could uh, see, what, what, what do you think the Supreme Court's going to do when they uh, I, rule on this? I don't think it's constitutional where you can tell a 23-year-old or a 25-year-old that you're going to buy that insurance because, you know, uh, and if we don't, we're going to send the IRS after you. I just don't think it's constitutional to mandate that. You know, it's one thing the states do that with insurance. I don't know how the federal government can do it. Then if they can do that, you set up a precedent, what else can they do? Mm -hmm. And part of the problem in Washington, we have too much government. Uh, everybody, there's a reason why there's only 10% of people think that, you know, members of Congress are doing a very good job. Washington is broken, and we need to have a smaller, more efficient government. Let's empower the local government and the state government. Let those dollars stay more here in our communities and a lot less in Washington because it's kind of like uh, cash, uh, cars for cash for clunkers. Mm -hmm. Someone told me that there was four... Uh, $1,000 average was what was paid for uh, the incentive for someone to, you know, trade in his clunker. But the government cost, when they administered it, was 24000 <laughs> They could have given everybody a free car. Almost. So, you know, Almost. that's a, a big, uh, why we need less government. Well, perhaps after the Supreme Court rules and, you know, when you can have an opportunity to come back, we can get that update, you know, what next steps are, are going to be, you know, whether it's a, a, the Supreme Court upholds it or whether or not it's going to be thrown out and there's new alternative. But, Congressman, I want to take a few minutes because I know how involved and uh, 
committed you are to veterans in, in, in this community, in, in your district. And, and there's been a lot of things that you have worked for on veterans' behalf. And, and I want to take a time, you, I know, and I want to take a few minutes as well, to talk about your most recent trip uh, to Afghanistan. And this is your, your third trip, is that correct? Yeah, third trip uh, to Afghanistan. I've been to Iraq as well. Mm -hmm. It, it's got to be uh, a deeply emotional experience, you know, flying over there and seeing you know, hundreds, thousands of you know American troops on the ground, getting the opportunity to meet them. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about that interaction with some of the troops and, and uh, commanders. Yeah, well, it, it's really two things. The reason I go, there's you know the big reason. I'll talk about that in a minute. But the other reason, I want to go and make my own assessment. Uh, we were, put, we're spending a lot of money. We put a lot of kids at, at risk over there. Uh, I want to make sure it makes sense. Now, when you get there, I met with a four-star general this past Sunday uh, and the ambassador also to the Afghanistan. They're much more open because uh, it's not they don't have a lot of press that we can talk with them, ask questions. And uh, so I think we're moving towards winding this war down. I think they're going to take 35,000. Uh, troops off the field in terms of uh, later this year, later summer, mm -hmm. and then I think by 2013-14 we'll, we'll be in a, a position to work with the Afghan security forces. Mm -hmm. But So I get that, but my biggest reason for going, we ask our young men and women to serve uh, in that area, and it is dangerous. I mean, we have 4,000 kids that we've lost. I've gone to those funerals. That's the toughest part of my job, see grieving families lose an 18-year-old. I went mm -hmm. in the service at 18. So I feel it's part of my job is to go over and work with the kids. I usually have lunch and uh, dinner, or I met with three different groups uh, in two different providences mm -hmm. in terms of Afghanistan. I want to know how those 18 and 20-year-olds are doing. I want to make sure we're doing everything we can for them. I want to remind them that the GI Bill is an incredible new improved bill that I co-sponsored that they can take advantage of. And when they get out, they've earned that college education. It's part of their commitment there. Mm -hmm. But I just want to make sure our kids are getting the support. Now, all that being said, I can tell you, a lot of them will tell me, we didn't get drafted, we signed up. They've got a great attitude. They're very committed to doing the best they can, and they're doing an outstanding job on behalf of Americans to, you know, to protect our freedoms uh, here at home. And I, I, I must tell you that it's got to be rewarding for uh, American men and women that are serving over there, you know, sit down, shake hands with a congressman who takes the time and the effort to not only make an initial trip but continue trips, you know, to kind of update and give them that sense of, uh, of of commitment. Well, I'm very proud of the young men and women that are serving there, and I want to make sure we're doing everything on behalf of the government. We put them in that position. Mm -hmm. They've got a great attitude. I want to make sure we're doing everything to support them, and I also want to make sure because I'm the first kid in my family to go to college. I want to encourage encourage them mm -hmm. and challenge them to go back if they can either get a great trade school or uh, the government will pay for as a part of their service or go back and get that four-year degree whether it's nursing it's or important. business to take advantage of uh, what they've earned there. But your trip, no matter how successful it was, you recently, your, your trip, uh, you, you were in the midst of a, a Taliban attack uh, during this most recent trip, isn't that correct? Well, yeah. Tell us about that kind of... Uh, well, we, we, got, we landed in Kabul, which is the capital of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. I went to, first off, uh, 9 o'clock we got there. We came in on a C-130, and, um, and then we went to a memorial service first uh, with the general and the ambassador, which in the past week, they do it every Sunday. Uh, they, you know, uh, have a special service for the fallen uh, heroes uh, there, not just Americans, but, you know, I think there were some British troops as well. Then I spent uh, about a half hour with our local troops uh, there, mm -hmm. primarily, uh, ideally, we try to go Sarasota, Manatee County, but also every, anybody in Florida, mm -hmm. and I'll sit and meet with them. And then I get about an hour and a half or two hour briefing. That went, that whole thing went from nine to noon. About noon, we got on a C-130. We went to a different part of Afghanistan, uh, Kandahar, mm -hmm. and to get a briefing in that Providence, and about uh, took about an hour to get there, so it's probably 400 miles south of uh, Kabul. And then we spent, uh, once we got there, we started our briefing. About an hour into the briefing, we find out that the Taliban, the Taliban that's what I was told anyway, uh, was bombing exactly where we were at, <laughs> us in the surrounding areas. 
And uh, so, but it wasn't something because we were there, it's something mm. they've been working on, they figured for a couple mm. of months. So in terms of rocket launchers and grenade launchers, and, and uh, so it was a nine hour uh, ordeal. Uh, we finally took care of it, but the bottom line was, is, uh, you know, I feel very fortunate I wasn't there. But at the end of the day, I, I, I tell people, look, this is about the kids. We ask them to go there. They're dealing with this every day. As a member of Congress, that's the least I can do is to go over and support them. And is there risk? Yeah, there's risk. But if we're going to put our kids there, we're asking them to do that on behalf of the administration, the Congress. I've got to be willing to go, and I do. Well, uh, Congressman, I have to say, you know, having you, you're making three trips there, it's, it shows a level of commitment and dedication, not only to you know to finding out about what the situation, assessing it, but also a sense of a commitment to those young men and women who continue to serve. But I want to segue from from that sense of commitment to recently there's been uh, a proposed for increases in health benefits for both active and retired military personnel. Can you tell us what your uh, position is on that and, and is that necessary? Well, uh, again, the I feel like the, I wrote a pretty aggressive letter to the president. I'd be glad to give you a copy of that. But the bottom line is, is TRICARE. Uh, these were things that were promised to them, commitments that were made to a lot of our mm -hmm. veterans. Uh, now they're asking them to pay a more percentage, and then they're talking about you know, very substantial percentage increases. And I just don't think it's right. And that's why you, we, we end up, when we take on other programs, we need to make the commitments we've done, the commitments we've made to our seniors in terms of Medicare and Social Security. They're right. viable long term. And we've made commitments to our veterans. And we need to keep those commitments. We don't need to run out and get six other other programs that we can't afford but because of the other programs it puts at risk the exactly. commitments and obligations that we've made to our servicemen and uh, women well I'd let, interest in how this plays out and in, in the next thing because you know as you just mentioned you know at both active and retired military they re, they depend upon that medical care you know and and yeah. will continue to depend and I, on. I hear that I just met with a bunch of veterans this morning and they're counting on it it's a part of their planning in terms of their retirement. Exactly. It's something they've earned. Exactly. And so we're going to fight for the veterans. And, and, and correspondingly, you know, I want to talk, a, a, take a few moments to talk about the Sarasota National Cemetery. Uh, you know, that's something that you've been involved with. You were there when they broke ground uh, on it. And you were there, you know, as it's, as it's uh, developed and grown. Um, What's the status right now of the Sarasota National? Why is it important to this, to this not only community, but to this entire area? Well, uh, because a lot of the veterans have to take their loved ones and move 150 miles north if mm -hmm. they want to do a military burial. Uh, setting up this new facility, which will be done, a lot of it will be done in the second phase of it, uh, coming this July. Mm -hmm. But I represent 97,000 veterans, but the cemetery will serve almost 400,000 veterans and their family. It's very important to them. When I came here, it was their top priority. It got started, but it wasn't anywhere uh, in terms of the funding. We were able to get the 18 million for the land, and then the first phase, I think, was 20 some million. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm very, very excited about it because uh, we're getting ready to conclude it, and then we're also, we got a gift for five or six million dollars in this Mantee, Sarasota area, that they're gonna build a world-class pavilion, mm -hmm. and then set up an endowment to take care of the maintenance on it going forward. So. The uh, veterans, the VA, do a great job in these cemeteries, but we will have a world-class facility for our veterans who deserve it and earned it, uh, you know, in terms of Sarasota Mantee County. It means a great deal to veterans and their families to have a place that, that is convenient, that is well-kept and well-cared for. Uh, so we'll continue to follow up on that and, and, and talk maybe perhaps to a program from the Sarasota for those people who not, are not familiar with it. Yeah, we're uh, not far, like we're a half hour away. I want to. Uh, I'd like to, as soon as we get a little bit further down the road, have you come out. And we get a chance to visit there, so the viewers get an opportunity. Talk to, to see some it. of the VA people yeah. that administer. Now, as we're winding down here a little bit, I want to take two. There's two quick things. I want to talk a, bit, a little bit about the House passage of the free trade agreements. And it was very critical. That's going to open up a lot of opportunities uh, in, in nationwide, uh, both for Col you know with Panama, Colombia, and Korea, South Korea. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, what impact do you see this is going to have on Florida? And what impact do you see you know, in this community? Yeah, well, I first think and for the country, uh, as you're talking about many estimates, but 250,000 jobs. But when you look at Panama and Colombia, 
uh, it makes a lot of sense because they do a lot of business. Florida is the gateway to Central and South America. Exactly. And it's a real opportunity, I think, for you know, our, our communities and 95% of the marketplace is outside the U.S. Now, I think historically, a lot of people say these trade agreements don't work. We're making sure that we're fighting for American jobs in our factories and making sure that we come out where it's at least a fair deal or even a better deal for the U.S. I think in the past we've compromised on a lot of these trade deals, mm. but I'm on the subcommittee for trade. I'm going to be fighting for America and American jobs. Well, you know, the free trade agreement, you know, and I think you hit it on the head with, you know, South America being, you know, a growing economies down there, and Florida can play a pivotal role in opening trade agreements with, uh, I think the port is interested mm -hmm. in opening new opportunities with Brazil, which yeah. is growing and uh, by leaps and bounds. Uh, Congressman, we're running out of time, and I want to give you an opportunity to kind of, you know, tell us and tell this community, uh, what are those major key issues that you're going to continue to work on, and what is what do you see as the challenges that are facing you? The biggest challenges I think facing the country, let's talk about a little bit longer term, is we've got to get our financial house in order. You can't, as families have made adjustments in the last couple of years, small businesses, we can't continue to spend money we don't have. We're putting not only our current seniors at risk and veterans, mm -hmm. we're putting our children and grandchildren at, let, uh, at rest. I'm an optimist, but if we don't change the way we do business in Washington in the next two, five, or eight years, we're gonna be the next Greece. I mean, our GDP, our debt exceeded our, our national economy, the GDP. Uh, it's the first time since World War II. We've got to change the way we do business in Washington. That's why I'm fighting every day for the constitutional balance budget amendment, one of the bill that I originally put, put forth uh, when I came to Congress in 2007. Secondly, is we've got to continue to fight for our small businesses. They create the majority of the jobs. We've got to create a better environment for them to risk and continue to uh, grow their business so they can create jobs. Mm -hmm. There's a great little book out there, and it's called The Battle. It's between big government and free enterprise and entrepreneurship and uh, uh, business startups. We've mm -hmm. got to focus more on uh, growing our free, inter free enterprise segment, right. small businesses, uh, you know, that's the future to America. So it's to those two things, getting our financial house in order and focus on small business and good paying jobs for people here in the community. Well, Congressman, again, I want to thank you for taking a few minutes out of your very busy schedule to update the citizens of Manatee and Sarasota County on all the things that you're involved with, you know, day to day, on the line, talking about. And we want to th thank you for, for doing this. This is very important to this community. And again, we would invite you back to come back at any time, kind of update this community and all those constituents that you represent. Next time we're going to change it, uh, I guess, when you let us know from District 13 to District 16. And, and when will that take effect? Uh, probably, be, uh, you know, after this next election, right. the first of the year. But uh, I'm excited because we're maybe I have 95 percent of Mantee County. I'll have 99.9. .9, so I'm very excited. It's been a great county. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Manatee County. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been very supportive, and I want to do everything I can to represent them the best of my ability. Congressman, thank you for joining us. And thank you for joining us on this special edition of Up Close on METV.